Give a big applause to Johan. Okay, thanks, Jeff. Okay, I'll try the stage as well. Um, let's see if I can stay on top of it. So, yeah, I'm Johan. I'm from Lighting Labs, a protocol engineer there, meaning I mostly work on LD, which we think is a pretty good lighting implementation. Uh, but of course, it can get better. And that's what we're working on. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges met when we're, we have been imp implementing the lighting protocol. Uh, especially, I'm going to talk about routing, what's hard about routing in the current state of the network, and how, uh, how we solved it um, while implementing this, and also what we can do going forward. Oh, OK, that's supposed to be some emojis. I don't know what happened there. So anyway, the routing problem. Uh, you might have heard that this problem is like an unsolvable problem that makes basically lightning useless. Uh, but contrary to common beliefs, this problem is not actually NP-hard. Uh, routing or pathfinding is actually a quite easy problem as long as you got all the information about the network topology. So that's basically what this problem boils down to, having the correct information about the network. Uh, because of if you're, the information you have about the Lightning Network channel graph is outdated or you're missing some information, this can lead to uh, you being unable to find paths or actually your payments failing during routing. So what kind of problems do we see or have we seen? First off, we have uh, the initial graph uh, or the in initial channel balances coming from uh, the current uh, spec, the current uh, lightning protocol spec. Uh, we, it's only supporting single funded channels, channels at this point, meaning that when you open a channel to a counterparty, all the balance will be on one side of the channels. Hopefully they will, this will get better over time when the channel is being used, but to begin with, it's not really usable for routing payments in the other direction. So one thing you could do to, to fix this, or to mitigate this, is to disable the channel direction that has no balance. So this is, this is possible today, uh, because you always, has, you always have to send out a channel update, uh, giving out like parameters, your fees, uh, different things about your channel, channels that, are, that the senders are gonna use to craft the payment. But currently, I think, at least LND doesn't do this yet, and I'm not sure if other implementations do this, because this actually leaks a little bit of privacy about the channels. If you would always disable the, um, the channel in the direction that has no balance, this would tell the network that you're the, not the one funding the channel, so you would know who is funding the channel. So there's some trade-offs there. Also, We've seen this a lot. Uh, people tend to create very small channels, uh, and they are not useful for routing very large payments. So uh, initially, capacity of channels must be checked on chain. The initial routing gossip doesn't contain any information about, about the channel capacity, meaning that some people that uh, doesn't want to go on chain to check the channel capacity might try to route the payment through your channel that's larger than the actual channel capacity. So a recent addition to the Bolt uh, was just added. Not sure if anybody is doing this yet, but it's, it's possible to do now. And that's adding a new field, max HLC, that you can add to your channel update, saying that I can only route payments up to this, side, this size. So that can help. Also, hopefully, something that's coming is AMP, uh, Atomic Multi Path Payments. This basically lets you split the payment into several small payments, and then you can utilize capacity of smaller channels. And then there's this problem of gossip overhead. So the, the way network conditions are, are transported around in the, in the lighting network is, is simple routing gossip. So you tell everything everything you know about the channel graph to your peers, and they will forward information, and so on and so forth. Uh, luckily, the block size 
prevents uh, people from opening like a thousands and thousands of channels. So that's okay. The main problem is channel updates. So channel updates are uh, updates about your channel parameters you can set basically at will and broadcast to all your peers. So that, that makes it possible for a bad, mo bad node to basically spam the network with a channel updates every, every few seconds. Uh, so most nodes has, uh, are using a 30 second trickle delay to fight this. Basically, when you learn about the new update, you will wait about 30 seconds before forwarding this to all your peers. And this makes it, uh, this avoids the problem of one bad node flooding the network with these updates. But still, there's a lot of information. And one thing we've seen is that on initial, on initial connect, or if a node has been offline for a while, it needs to get all the new information about uh, what has happened or how the current state of the network is. And this can lead to like a burst uh, of, of data coming from your peers. So you're basically, in the initial version of the Bolt, you're basically asking your peer when you came online, give me everything you know about the channel graph. And this was <laughs> turned out to become like a massive amount of data. And possibly most of this data was also redundant. Maybe I, I had only been offline for, for a few minutes or a few hours, but the peers would send you all the information you knew about the graph, even though I had this information from before. So one thing that was added to, added to the, the specification is something called uh, channel graph sync queries. And this lets you, when you come online, ask your peers to only give me information from a certain point in time. So if I've been all offline for just a few seconds or a few minutes, I can tell, the, tell my peer I only want everything that happened on the network after, after I last, last time I went offline. So that helps a lot. But still, there's some data you will receive, and you, would need, you will need to verify this data, validate the received channels you get from your peers. And this was this should be done by checking the UTXO state uh, to see if this channel is real and if it's still not closed. And this is fairly easy for a full node. Uh, you have the UTXO state like at hand, so you can just check if this channel is still open. But for light clients, this is a harder problem. Uh, there are several light clients proposals how to do this efficiently. Uh, but one thing, one hack, one can do to actually create a better user experience in most cases is not validating the, the channels before you try using them. The reason this works is that if the channel is closed or it doesn't exist, then you will find this out during your payment attempt. So if it, in most cases, the channel is real, you, since you're getting it from your peers, you kind of, uh, if you kind of rely a little bit on your peers, not forwarding, like stale channels, then you might be able to get your payment through while, uh, while your light client is working on validating the, validating the channels. And then there's this problem of unreliable nodes. So you might have seen numbers like that the net Lightning Network graph is now this big. It has 10,000 nodes running. Uh, fun fact, most of those nodes are offline. They're not active. So, because a lot of nodes, they come online, they create a few channels, they broadcast these, these channels to the whole network, and then they go offline. And when nodes go offline, you cannot route payments through their channels. But you have really no way of knowing this before starting uh, or trying to use that channel in a payment. So, what a recent addition to LND, to LND uh, 0.5, which uh, it's in our release candidate now, should be out uh, fairly soon, is that we try to help the network by disabling inactive channels. This means that if I uh, have a few peers that go offline, I will send out a channel update disabling this channel after, after a certain timeout. This means that no other nodes will know that I shouldn't try forwarding through these channels because they are disabled. And hopefully that should, should get rid of a lot of this uh, 
like stale channels for offline nodes that we see on the network. One thing you should also do if you are spinning up a node and you're not planning to like stay online and be a routing node is that all your channels should probably be private. A, a private channel is not broadcasted, broadcasted to the network, so only your peers will know about the channel. Uh, and this is great for most nodes because you don't like you don't let the network forward uh, useless information, and it's also a nice privacy gain because people want only your peers will know about your channels. And then there's also those kind of peers that we call flapping peers. They are not offline, but they're very often offline, so they go like kind of like back and forth, sometimes offline, sometimes online. And these channels are, in most cases, also useless. Uh, the reason being that uh, you don't really know how long it's gonna, uh, when they're gonna come back online, and your payments can get stuck, or you should probably not forward payments uh, to these nodes. What you could do in this case is also disabling the channel uh, to tell other nodes that you should probably not forward on this channel, or you can outright ban these nodes if you're and close the channel because it's probably useless anyway. And then there's the probably the biggest uh, problem uh, building a network like this, and this is that the network is dynamic, so the conditions they change all the time. Channel fees can change, meaning that if I'm running a node and I have a bunch of channels, I can decide to actually tune the parameters of my channels. Maybe I want to increase my fees or decrease them uh, because I feel that's beneficial for me. Uh, and then, and then this, this update needs to be broadcasted to the whole network. For me, as a sender of a payment, that's bad because if a payment I'm trying to use just had its uh, channel parameters change, I can try to craft a payment that is not longer valid for that channel. And, that's, and that means the, channel will, uh, the payment will fail when it gets to that channel. One thing that was added to the spec and is like very useful, is, makes a huge impact, is that when my payment gets to that channel, that's uh, now I know I have outdated information about, so my channel is going to fail. The, the node on the, on the start of that channel will actually send me an error back to the sender and he will include the latest channel update for that channel. Meaning that when I get that error back, I know that I had outdated information. I now can like tweak my payment with the new information and try again. So this, this is a huge, this is a very nice way of like quickly getting the new information back to the, to the sender that needs it at that point in time. Uh, then there's also these problems of balance, balances changing. So, Payments are going on on the network. A channel has some, a certain balance, and this will change every time somebody makes a payment through this channel. What we could do, we could tell everybody about the channel balance, uh, channel balance, but that's not really a good solution because that will leak information about like all payments going on in the network. So we probably don't want to do that. So the main way you should fight this as a, uh, as a node is just be smarter about estimating the probabilities of your payments going through a particular channel. And you could also be even smarter, and we've seen somebody doing this, is by probing the channel balances by kind of sending payments through themselves, uh, bigger and bigger payments all the way to like they fail, so they will know the balances of the channel. You should probably not do this. Uh, you won't be very popular if you spam the network with payments like this, and um, yeah, we should, you should be smarter than that. Yeah. Yeah, so there's like, yes, so how can you, in a, in a protocol, can you pay yourself? And basically, you can do that because every node in the, uh, on the payment route want to know who, is who, the, who the payment is coming from and where it's going. So basically, you can create an a onion packet, a, a payment that goes through a number of hops and back to yourself. Uh, and you can also, uh, currently, you can just 
add uh, like a, a known payment hash to the to the payment, so such it will never be settled. So you can send some payment to a node in the network. It will recognize that I don't know anything about this payment hash. I will just send an error back, and you can use that to get some information about the channel balances. And then there's this problem uh, that I think probably most software projects have, and that there's bugs in the implementation. So uh, even something as simple as a routing algorithm can have bugs. And one thing that was just fixed in LMD 0 0.5 is that we were not properly accounting for uh, forwarded fees uh, during a multi-hop payment. So this was fixed by instead of searching for a route from the source, the sender, to the target node, we instead started the target node uh, and search all the way back to the source, which lets us know, like at every, and the, let the, um, the pathfinding algorithm at every step of the, of the search know how much fees he needs to forward to the next hop. Also, I mentioned this, this clever solution of sending back a channel update if well, it turns out somebody's trying to, to forward on my, my channel that ha now has um, outdated channel parameters. So we were actually, in some cases, sending back the channel update for the wrong direction in that case. That meant that you as a sender would send, uh, you would send a payment, it would fail. Uh, the, the forwarding node would send a channel update back that you would apply, but it wouldn't make a difference because you weren't trying to forward in that direction. So it was useless. So this was, this was fixed in LND 0 0.5, and we think this is going to also help uh, the success rate of uh, payments are a lot. Okay, so how is how is the current uh, routing working in LND? We have a notion of something. We have a module called Mission Control. A Mission Control module is what gives the pathfinding uh, algorithm everything it needs to know about uh, the graph to be able to find a route to the destination. Uh, each time you want to pay an invoice, it's going to create a payment session object. This session will give you like a number of candidate routes you can try to pay until a success happens or you give up trying to find a route. Uh, this is pretty simple at the moment, so it's non-persistent, meaning that if I'm trying to pay a, a destination, uh, I've tried a number of times, I do some have some routing failures, but eventually I'm able to get my payment through. Uh, and if I want to pay another invoice to the same destinations, I would, destination, I would do the whole set of errors all over again. It would uh, just try, it won't remember anything from the previous attempt, and it will do most likely a lot of the same failures. So this uh, can be improved. So enter mission control ng. Uh, this is a high-level overview of how we envision this will look like. The main point here is that the different modules uh, is independent. They're all, if you know Go, they're all behind an interface such that you can, you, can, um, you can change them out and you can improve them independently. So what will happen here is that you can have a simple uh, uh, standard pathfinding shortest path algorithm that is trying to do the, to find a route in the network and do the payment. Uh, it will ask the payment session about edges and nodes that are relevant for the target I'm trying to, to reach. And it will also ask the payment session about edge weights that will be used uh, to find the shortest path, but this is not always the shortest path. It could also be what the payment session uh, is thinking. This, is determining to be the, the best path, whatever that means. Uh, when the pathfinding algorithm is finding a, uh, found the route, it tries to do the payment, and it will report back uh, if this payment was a success or a failure to the payment session. And the payment session can then use this to improve on the next round of uh, payment attempts. And of course, when uh, the payment session or the, the final payment either succeeds or fails. Uh, the payment session will report the information back to mission control such that mission control 
the next time a payment is being init initiated, it can reuse this information it learned from the previous payment at attempt. And mission control is also what gets everything that's happening in the network, so it, this can be used to, to, this is of course needed to be able to have a graph in the first place. Uh, yeah, I, there's a link here if you want to know how such an interface can look like. You can, I don't know, maybe we'll share these slides and you can go to that link. Okay, so that's more or less what I had about like generalized problems in routing and how they can be solved. Uh, we have LND 0.5 almost out now. So if you want to check that out, please do. Uh, it has a ton. It has a ton of bug fixes, of course, and we have uh, some great additions uh, related to routing. Uh, one is what I mentioned: the query graph sync, such that you will, all, you will only get like the updates that are relevant for you on first connect. We are doing a lot more aggressive graph pruning uh, to filter out like dead nodes, dead channels, channels that have like not been updated in a while, nodes that doesn't. Maybe they don't even have channels anymore or have been offline. We have a new RPC called Send to Route. This is useful for everybody that wants to experiment with their own pathfinding or their own like routing heuristics. It lets you craft your own routes and attempt to send them uh, using LND. We have, as I mentioned, we have automatic channel disabling such that we will disable channels that where the counterparty has been offline for a while, and of course, a ton of bug fixes. Uh, so please check that out. I'm not sure if the release notes are out yet, but they should be in a few days. And it also has huge improvements to the Neutrino Light client, so check that out. And that's it. Any questions? Yes. Yes, so the question was that if it makes sense for light clients to only keep like a limited view of the network to make uh, routing simpler and less data to hold. So I think there's been some uh, research into this and possibly it's a good idea, but I think we should see how big the network grows uh, before we start doing something like that. I envision that most nodes actually won't participate in the like public graph of the network. So as I mentioned, you can open private channels if you're not planning to be like a routing node. So uh, if every, everybody does that, then the core network, the core public network, all the information that needs to be gossiped around about, uh, about channels and nodes are only gonna be for routing nodes, which are nodes with like a lot of capacity, uh, they a good uptime and things like that. So maybe the the public network won't be as big. Uh, hopefully, uh, the, the whole network in itself will be big, but maybe the public one won't, won't be, so maybe it's not even something we need. Yes, so, uh, yeah, so I think your question was that some of the visualizers show, are showing nodes that are not longer online, right? Yeah, so this, as I mentioned, uh, LND 0 0.5 is now more aggressively pruning those nodes. So possibly the visualizer were just uh, reading from maybe LND or some other implementations database, and it, we would just keep this node in the graph even though is not longer participating in the network graph. So LND, the new version of LND should be much smarter about like removing those nodes and maybe the visualizers will also reflect, reflect this change. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, so if we imagine everybody is doing this, so imagine all good nodes on the network will disable channels for uh, offline counterparties. So if one node go goes offline, meaning that all its peers will disable the channels going through that node, this means that there's no way for you to route into that node anymore, meaning that it will basically be taken off uh, the network graph. And hopefully that will, hopefully most nodes will do this and we could get to a healthy network. Yes, so when I said weights, I put it like in this sign, I don't know the name of. The um, uh, reason being is that there's no, there's, there's no such thing as a weight uh, in the network, in the Lightning Network spec. This is only like locally on your, on your, in your pathfinding algorithm, you would need some kind of notion of how expensive is it for me to use a weight, uh, use a edge. And this could be, it could, you could be use fee, Maybe you'll try always try to like minimize your fee, but maybe in some cases uh, the payment session will s tell you that okay this edge has a very low fee, but I have calculated that it is very unreliable, so I wouldn't recommend you to try use use this uh, use this edge because it's unreliable. So most most likely your payment will fail. So then I will, even though it has a, like a very low fee, I will increase the weight to avoid the pathfinding trying to use that edge in a payment. What is used right now as weights, basically? Uh, in LMD, it's a combination uh, of fees and time locks. Maybe a short second question. <laughs> and does it work? Yeah, OK. Um, then a short second question. If you have private channels, can you still receive payments? Because you have to be routed to. Yeah, that's a good question. So, in the case of private channels, uh, how this is how Lightning Network works is that you create an invoice uh, for a payment, and the, in Bolt 11, which is like the invoice spec, there's you have like these extra fields in the invoice where you can add like something we call like a route hints. So basically, when you're trying to pay an invoice like that, you get like all the information about. Uh, the amounts, the destination, and so forth, but you also get like a few uh, ha hints about private channels that you can use. So when I want to receive a payment, I will tell you I want to receive uh, 100 satoshis, and here are four channels, private channels that I own, that you can try <laughs> to route through. One. Yes. It is on-chain. Please repeat. It is a regular multi-sig transaction on-chain. Yeah. Oh, private? Oh, yeah. So the question was, uh, uh, is a private channel uh, on-chain? It is. The funding transaction is still on-chain, but it looks like a regular multi-sig uh, transaction, and you don't tell the whole network about this channel. So basically, Sorry. only Sorry. the peers will know about this, this channel. Yeah, in the ideal case, there's no way to know. <laughs> yes? The, the, the problem of depleted channels that are unidirectional because somebody flooded the net with a big payment and everybody uh, ended up with a completely unbalanced channel. Uh, what is the future for this? Will it be some kind of automatically process or will this be stick for a long time with us? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Like, how can we avoid the network being like just being balanced in one direction and no other payments being able to go the other way? Uh, so imagine there's like a demand for sending payment in, payments in this other direction. That means I have an incentive to start opening channels in that direction. So if I see that, a lot of people are trying to pay from one side of the network to the other one, but there's no balance in that direction. I can set up like a new channel and I can charge a huge fee or at least bigger fees than what I could do otherwise. Because if people actually are demanding to send payments in that direction, I have an incentives, incentive to set up a channel and I can, for a while, I can charge what I want for those payments. How do I recognize the situation? Will this be automatically? 
So how would you recognize that situation? Um, that's, a good, that's a good question. Uh, maybe you could try doing payments yourself and see that it fails. And you could tell that way. Or I think there's several ways of doing this. Um, I don't have any like perfect solution on the top of my head. Yes. If you had to identify those opportunities, would you have, you'd have to have an understanding of the whole network of like, your people have that top down view of the whole network? Uh, so the question was to understand those unbalanced situations, you would need to know kind of like all balances in the network. Uh, maybe that, that would certainly give you all the information you need to know where to open channels. Uh, but maybe maybe you know enough to try open a channel, right? So maybe you have like, you don't know for sure, but you have an idea that a lot of payments in that direction uh, is failing. So you can open a channel and see if there's demand, basically. Yeah? Yeah, you spot opportunities, uh, trial and error. Uh, hopefully this will grow organically and people will find ways to see where liqui liquidity is needed in a network. And there's also this notion of li liquidity providers, which I'm not going to talk about. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so it's not a protocol spec. It's only like the pathfinding algorithm client side uh, change. So it's not uh, routing is not in the spec at all. So still, uh, we are doing source routing. We are just sending payments. Uh, we're just calculating the route the other way around, such that we can properly account for fees when we are crafting the the source to the target uh, route. Any other questions? Okay, if not, uh, thank you. And finally, uh, more questions, come, just come talk to me. And also, if you wanna try LND, please, please do. And we also have 